completion characteristics you know, that talk about uh, explaining how uh, production trends in the Powder River Basin and the D Denver Basins uh, uh, it, from their, their unconventional reservoirs, and you'll learn about what unconventional reservoirs are here during uh, Rachel's talk. Um, she also is involved in developing and maintaining the online GIS mapping platforms uh, for Wyoming's oil and gas reservoir and infrastructure data. And probably critically, uh, besides all that good stuff, she enjoys traveling, playing tennis, softball, camping, and dog sledding with her four Siberian Huskies. So if you would join me in welcoming Rachel Turner. Thank you, and thank you to the geologist at Jackson Hole for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys. Um, when I was telling people that I was gonna come do a, a talk at, on oil and gas in Jackson, I got a couple reactions of, I'm sorry, and why? <laughs> and so, and then when they found out that I was doing it in a church, they said, well, we will pray for you. So, <laughs> so I kind of wanted to preface my talk with um, the fact that the Wyoming State Geological Survey is not a regulatory agency. Um, our mission is to investigate um, the geology of the state and to um, give that, convey that data out to the public for use by um, the general public, governments, industry, everybody. So um, we're not associated with industry. So we'll um, dive in here. Let's see if I can get this to advance here. Uh, Worked a second ago. Hold on a second. Oh, crap. I can sit back here and do the slides for you if you want. It's kind of, hold on a second. Stuff, even the page down isn't doing it. Um, deep. um I'll start out just by giving a little bit of overview on the state's oil and gas industry. Um, Wyoming has always been in the running as far as oil and gas production. And as of um, the Energy Information Administration or EIA's um, last stats, uh, Wyoming ranks eighth both in oil production and gas produ production nationally. And we have, we are not resource limited as far as oil and gas is concerned. Um, this, these are 2017 reserve estimates from the EIA. And if you do the math, this works out to Wyoming being able to supply the entire nation for um, its oil use for 46 days and its gas use for 262 days. So. And this is a couple years old, so these numbers may even be different or more by now. Um, Wyoming gets its oil and gas from these energy basins around the state. Um, they're uh, what's in between all the mountain ranges. And this talk is going to focus on the Powder River Basin up in the northeast corner of the state. It's um, a deep, basin and it's bounded on the west by the Bighorn Mountains, um, on the east by the Black Hills, and on the south and the east by the Laramie Range and the Hartville Uplift. If you take a cross section of the basin, um, you can see that it's a pretty deep asymmetric basin and the basin axis uh, is more toward the western margin and it separates these really steeply dipping strata to the west so these would be like around the bighorn mountains and you'd see the flat irons um, that are really steeply dipping here and then it um, that axis separates these steeply, steeply dipping ones from the more shallow dipping ones over to the east. And uh, 
there is about 18,000 feet of sediment that's been deposited here in the Powder River Basin. The basin itself has been producing oil for a long time. The first well was drilled back in 1889, um, just north of Salt Creek Field. This is Casper right here. Douglas is over here. Salt Creek is north of um, Casper. And that well was drilled just north of that field. This is not it. This is a, a couple years later, about 1910, but I thought it was a cool picture of an old well. Um, the basin itself has always either been producing a lot of oil or a lot of gas. Um, this is a graph that shows oil production in, in black and gas production in red. So you'll see, and this is from 1978 through 2018. So you'll see that um, it's always had extensive resources that they are producing out of this right, this um, peak right here is the coal bed methane boom. So um, the USGS did a assessment of the basin a few years ago and they identified six of these TPSs, which are total petroleum systems. And I had to throw this in there if anybody gets this reference. A TP, what is a TPS? It's not, it's not that. Um, a total petroleum system is all the essential elements and processes that have to occur in the right time, space, and order so that organic material can be converted into petroleum and accumulated somewhere that we can develop it. So conventional total petroleum systems have several elements that they require to um, be part of these systems. The first one is you have to have a source rock and specifically you have to have organic rich source rocks. So where do you get organic rich source rocks. Typically their best source is from um, deep water environments. So there's several times in the past that Wyoming has either been partially or completely underwater and under these seaways. One of them um, that I'll talk about for one of these conventional systems was back in the Permian, which is about 250 to 300 million years ago. Um, oops, hit the, hold on a second. Um, if this is Wyoming, you can see that this seaway extends over into um, the western part of the state. And uh, this is the time period of which, during which the Phosphoria formation was formed. And then a little later on, about 166 million years ago during the Cretaceous, there was another seaway um, transgression. There were a series of transgressions and regressions, but for the most part, there was a seaway that um, encompassed most of, if not a lot of Wyoming. And this is the time frame during which the Maori Shale was deposited. And the Maori and the Phosphoria are considered the source rocks for a lot of the conventional um, petroleum systems in the Powder River Basin. So this is a strat chart and this is where the Phosphoria was deposited and then you've got the Maori up here. And if you look at these in outcrop, you can see that they are these rich organic dark shales. So they're good, good sources of hydrocarbon. So the next thing that a conventional system requires is you have to bury the rock, that source rock, deep enough to cook it and to start um, forming the hydrocarbons from the, just the basic organic materials. So a lot of times you'll see these um, burial history curves. And what this is, is it just shows you the depth at which you hit the oil window, and then this is the gas window. These are vitronite reflectance values, and typically you hit the oil window about 0.5% vitronite reflectance. So if you, 
here's the Maori shield. This is, sorry, let me back up. This is a um, burial history curve for the western side of the Powder River Basin. So if you look at the Maori shale and you backtrack, you can see that it hits the oil window right about here. So it started producing um, oil about right at the end of the Cretaceous, 65, 4 or 65 million years ago. Um, I don't have a burial history curve for the Phosphoria. That's out in another basin, but the Phosphoria started producing um, oil during the late Cretaceous, or it's the late Jurassic into the start of the Cretaceous. So we've got our source rocks, we've got them buried deep enough. Oh, and a lot of times um, you, this will uh, be an indication of how mature your hydrocarbons are. So the, the greater the vitronite reflex, reflectance, the more mature your hydrocarbons are. So the next thing that a petroleum system requires in a conventional play is migration. The hydrocarbons that are generated don't usually stay where they were created. So a lot of times they will, um, due to changes in pressure in the reservoir, um, expansion of the carrageen, just the oil generation itself will force the hydrocarbons out of those source rocks and move it elsewhere in the basin. And this is what happened, especially with the Phosphoria. Um, if you remember, the Phosphoria was formed over in the western side of the state, and um, they have interpreted the conventional reservoirs in the Powder River Basin as having um, hydrocarbons that migrated clear from the western Wyoming over into the Powder River Basin. So our next element that we need is when it's migrating, it needs some place to go. So that's what we typically call a reservoir. Um, for conventional reservoirs, they are usually, deter a conventional reservoir, it typically has pretty high porosity and pretty high permeability. And so just to clarify what porosity and permeability is, this um, diagram shows that these grains right here don't have any space between them. So there's no porosity, there's no pore space, and there's nothing connected. So it's not permeable either, right? These grains right here have pore spaces between them. So they have some porosity, but they're not connected. So the, um, any fluid that's in them or liquids or gases can't flow through that. This over here, has both pro high porosity and permeability because the pore spaces are connected to each other. So this is kind of what you're looking at with these conventional reservoirs. Um, and looking at our strat column, below the phosphoria, we have these thick uh, sandstones and carbonates that have excellent um, reservoir uh, properties. They're thick, they are extensive, they have high porosity and permeability, and, um, and they're consistent. So they, their depositional environment was pretty consistent throughout, so their facies don't change a lot. Um, this is just a picture, what I was talking about with the flat irons on the um, western side of the basin. This is just west of Buffalo, and that's the 10 sleep um, sandstone. This is the Madison limestone. And interestingly, the, um, the ten sleep and the Minnelusa are, are considered equivalents. And the Minnelusa formation um, was the top producing oil reservoir in the basin up until 2013. So it was a pretty extensive reservoir. So once you get it into, once you get the hydrocarbons into the reservoir, you don't want it to go any place. So you need to have something to seal it off. And a lot of times, gypsum salts and hydrites, these gypsum and salts are calcium sulfate minerals. Those are the best barriers to um, 
hydrocarbon migration. So those will seal it in. So if you look at our strat column, this chug water group and even the gypsum spring formation have a lot of these um, gypsum layers that will help seal in the hydrocarbons underneath them. And some will leak out due to faulting, but for the most part, they're a pretty good um, barrier. So the final thing that you need with the conventional petroleum system is you need some way to trap it, trap the, um, the hydrocarbons so that they, they pool together and don't go anyplace. <laughs> so there's a couple of types of traps. There are structural traps, and those are, examples of these are on these, this, these two panels right here, where the rocks are either folded or faulted so that the, re the oil and gas can't migrate any further. This is a, an aerial photo of the Salt Creek field. And, you can, and the Salt Creek field is a classic anticline um, conventional reservoir. And you can even see at the, surf, the surface expression of the anticline um, with the middle part eroded out. And you can see all the well pads in here. Um, the other type of trap that you'll find is a stratigraphic trap. And that's simply when the depositional environment of a formation, you know, when a formation is being deposited, the depositional environment changes. And for some reason, the um, permeability and porosity changes from something that's high permeability to um, low permeability, and it just traps it with some seals on either side. <laughs> so um, these conventional traps are are nice because they have a pretty defined spatial extent. Um, this is a screenshot off of the survey's oil and gas map, and it's easy to draw polygons around the, um, this, these structures. This is Salt Creek right here, so you can see it's this nice round little polygon. So here's our total petroleum system for um, the conventional Powder River Basin plays. Um, we're missing one thing though. We need to get the oil and gas out. And we, the conventional plays are typically produced using vertical wells. Um, so the point of the vertical wells is to drill as far into the um, reservoir as possible so that you get the, the largest um, thickness basically that you can without um, drilling too far into something that you don't want to produce like water. So these conventional uh, plays and these vertical wells are very dependent on um, in situ pressures or the pressure of the reservoir and this is what you typically call primary recovery where you're just pumping or the well is flowing by itself. But eventually these um, traps and these pools and these reservoirs start getting depleted. So they need to um, try to start giving it some help. And so they do this through the means of these secondary and tertiary um, recovery methods. And what they'll do is if this is your, your original vertical well, they will drill a, a well a little bit a ways away from it and they will inject water for the secondary water floods into the um, well bore and it will increase the pressure in that reservoir and it will help force some of the oil and gas into the, um, the original oil and gas well. And then the tertiary re recovery methods use either heat or gas. And you'll often hear um, carbon dioxide used. So this is, you'll see CO2 enhanced oil recovery a lot. That's, that's what that is. Um, and this, that Salt Creek field is actively undergoing 
um, a pretty extensive CO2 EOR process right now. Um, this is a graph showing what went on in the powder river basin since about 1974. It's a little bit out of date, but for the most part, the, get, the green is the oil production and the red is the gas production. And they were producing using conventional methods and these tertiary and secondary recovery methods um, for quite a long time, but even with that, oil production started to decrease. This right here is again that coal bed methane play, so that's what that kick in gas production is. But as far as oil goes, the conventional reservoirs were starting to become pretty depleted, even with these secondary and tertiary recovery methods. But right about 2006, 2007, they started transitioning to unconventional plays. And as you can see, things started kicking up as far as oil production goes. So what's an oil, unconventional play? We still need a, a source rock. Um, and in this case, uh, for the Powder River Basin, we still like those dark organic rich shales. So we've um, the Maori shale, there's the Carlisle shale, and you've probably heard the Niobrara formation being kicked around. So those are typically considered to be some of the um, primary source rocks in the Powder River Basin. Still need to bury it, get it deep enough to, to bake those hydrocarbons and produce them. Um, I already talked about the Maori starting to, to um, produce oil at about 64, 65 million years ago. The Niobrara didn't start producing until about 30 million years ago, but it's, a, it's a deep enough that it does produce quite a bit of oil and gas. Migration is a little bit different. Um, although the source, the hydrocarbons will migrate out of these source rocks, a lot of it still is left in place. And a lot of times in unconventional plays, this is what they're targeting. They're actually targeting, the reservoir is actually the source rock. So they're, they're not looking for a separate um, formation all the time. Um, the most important thing about unconventional reservoirs is that they were typically considered to be uneconomic to produce using those vertical conventional methods. Um, they were often bypassed when they were drilling those wells just because they didn't have the high porosity and the high permeability. Um, and that's kind of the hallmark of an unconventional reservoir is its low porosity and permeability. Permeability is measured in something called Darcy's. And most unconventional reservoirs have permeabilities on the range of nano Darcy's to milli Darcy's. Just for comparison's sake, conventional reservoirs have permeabilities of like 100 to thousands of milli Darcy's. Concrete is 0.1 to one millidarcy. And so you're looking at things that are tighter than concrete in some cases. And not necessarily in the Powder River Basin, but in some cases, the viscosity of the hydrocarbons make it really difficult um, to produce from unconventional plays in other places. I'll talk about that here in a second. So let's talk about what types of unconventional reservoirs there are. There's several. Um, You'll often hear people talk about tight plays. Um, a lot of times when they talk about tight oil and gas reservoirs, what they're talking about are these low permeability sandstones and siltstones. And in the Powder River Basin, some of these um, formations that you'll hear are the Teapot, the Parkman, Shannon Sussex, the Turner and the Wall Creek. And these are a little bit different than some of these other ones that are called shale gas or oil um, reservoirs, um, basically just because this is super low permeability. 
but it's because it's a shale instead of a sandstone. And in the Powder River Basin, again, it's, they're targeting the Niobrara and the Maori. Just a side note, um, shale oil does not equal oil shale. You'll hear people talk about oil shale. Oil shale is are shales that contain kerogen, and in order to extract that kerogen, you either have to physically mine it with surface mines, or you have to extract it using thermal methods. The Powder River Basin does not have those. Um, those only exist over in the Greater Green River Basin, and they haven't figured out legal or <laughs> mechanical ways to extract that yet. So just a, just a side note that um, coal bed methane, coal bed natural gas is considered an unconventional play. Um, this is Buffalo, Sheridan, Gillette, and the yellow is the boundary of all the wells that have produced coal bed methane in the Powder River Basin. So you can see that that was a pretty extensive unconventional play. It's not um, going on very much anymore now, but it's lumped in there. Just a couple other ones that you might hear about. Um, oil sands are very heavy, immature sand oils um, that are in unconsolidated sands. We don't have any in the Powder River Basin or Wyoming. These are up in Canada, but you'll hear, hear about them sometimes. And then you'll also hear about gas hydrates, <coughs> which is where the, um, the methane and the gases actually freeze. And you'll find these um, in permafrost and in submarine environments. And again, we don't have those <laughs> in Wyoming. So to get back to our unconventional system, you can see that we've got quite a few um, unconventional reservoirs in the Powder River Basin. And they're, they're focused on the upper Cretaceous um, formations, all those sandstones and Honestly, some of these shales in here are probably being targeted too. Um, we have the seals, again, because we've got so many shales interbedded um, with these tight sands, do a pretty good job of holding it in and not letting it get away. And then the last thing that's a little bit different about an unconventional play is that the, the traditional structural and stratigraphic traps are not as important because these uh, tight sands and shales, the oil and gas is actually distributed through the pore spaces of the whole formation. So they're not targeting a, a pool that's accumulated in a specific place. So it's really hard to draw a polygon around, <laughs> around these, um, reservoirs because basically you probably have to include the whole formation. So it's less spatially defined, but in general, you, it's going to occur over a wider area. So to pr and the other thing that you will all, um, also need with an unconventional play is horizontal wells because these are so, um, extensive and um, low porosity and permeability, you need this special technology, which they've come up with, which is horizontal wells to produce these um, tight sands and shales. A couple things that they have to think about when they're drilling these wells is how long they're gonna drill them. Are they gonna drill them, you know, a mile or two miles, I think two miles, is not unusual now. Um, they need to decide what direction they're going to um, drill them. So if you look, these are, each of the dots is a surface hole, and then the, these are surface expressions of the lateral of the well. So for the most part, these, all these wells are pretty much drilled north-south. Um, the reasons why you would drill a well one direction or another have to do with um, 
to begin with stress, regional stress, all the, the formations and the basins in the state actually are, have a, a stress field put on them right now, or not put on them, but they are undergoing a, a strain just from um, sediment and tectonic um, processes. So when you're drilling a horizontal well, if this is your stress direction, typically operators want to drill perpendicular to that maximum horizontal stress so that their lateral is perpendicular and when they frack, their fracks are going to open parallel to the maximum horizontal stress direction. Right now in the Powder River Basin, um, this shows that the horizontal stress field is about 70 degrees, so it's north 70 east. Um, so you would think that most wells are going to be drilled perpendicular to that, probably around 160, 165. Um, some other things, though, that might limit the direction that they can drill are regulatory agencies. Um, the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission comes up with these drilling spacing units and you can see for the most part that these are north-south spacing units. They call these stand-up units. These up here are lay-down units. The wells are drilled generally east-west. Um, so sometimes you're limited by what they've decided on at the state. <laughs> Um, but there is some room to angle these wells, even within those spacing units. And everybody's favorite topic. The other, <laughs> the other thing that you need to have to produce these unconventional plays is you got to frack the well. Um, because they're so tight, um, the operators need to pump pretty significant amounts of fluids and propent down the wells in order to um, help break up the, um, to, to fracture the reservoir and to prop it open so that the oil and gas can flow through. And this is one thing that I was kind of surprised to learn when I started working is that water makes up you know, quite a significant amount of the fluid that's pumped down these wells for frack jobs. So I'm going to play a little video. Um, this, this is a oil and gas company's video. Um, it's by no means um, an advertisement for them. There's several out here <laughs> on the internet. I found this on YouTube. I just thought it was a really good um, graphic way to show you guys how these wells are drilled and what it means to frack a well. So I got to oh. click on this. So I guess there's no sound, but that's fine. So I'll narrate. <laughs> um, once it gets to it. So basically what they're doing is they're going to drill the surface um, part of the well. So they, they drill down and in this video they talk about how they uh, make sure that they want to drill below the freshwater zone. And once they get to a certain point below that, then they will stop the bit, extract it back up, and then they will put a casing down. It's a steel casing, typically, and then they'll concrete or cement that um, steel casing in. And their, their point is that they're trying to protect the freshwater zones. Then when, once that's done, they'll send the drill bit back down the hole and then at the kickoff point, which is when they start turning the well horizontal, um, 
then they can drill, like I said, for up to two miles. And then case that with some more cement. <laughs> they make a big point of this. <laughs> And then what they'll do is um, clean out the well. And then this is where they um, lower in a perforation gun and they um, perforate the casing and into the formation and then they'll extract that perforation gun. And this is where they say they um, uh, bring in the trucks to frack the well. So this is where they force the water and the fluids into the, the well bore along with propant to prop open those fractures. And then this is a plug that they set to kind of separate the um, fracks that they just did from the next ones that they're going to do. And so each one of those is called a frack stage. And then they just repeat the process pretty much along the whole length of the, of the well lateral. And then they'll actually come in and drill out those, those plugs. And when they do that, then oil and or gas will be allowed to flow up to the surface. So, I don't know. I thought that was kind of a good little video just to, to show um, how they do it. Um, horizontal wells are really good at increasing the amount of surface area that they're in contact with. So instead of the vertical wells that are only going through the thickness of the um, reservoir, the horizontal wells are, are able to extend through the whole, you know, lateral extent of the formation. So you get a lot more bang for your buck. Another good thing about horizontal wells is that they're able to drill multiple horizons off the same well site. So in the Powder River Basin, this is pretty useful because you've got more than a mile of these stacked unconventional plays. And so you're able to access them from the same well pad. And horizontals are now um, the most are what they're drilling for, what they're using horizontals pretty much significantly for the oil production in the Powder River Basin and the state. This is um, oil production and you can see that horizontals are over 50, 60% um, of what they're producing out of. Gas is a little um, different. The vertical and the directional wells over in the Greater Green River Basin are still producing the most gas, but they're starting to produce um, gas out of horizontals in the state too. The other thing about um, horizontals is they have pretty steep decline curves. So they start out producing quite a bit and then it falls off significantly after the first year or two. But so that's one reason why they need to keep drilling. Um, but if you look at this, this is, these different colors are progressively um, more recent years. So they're actually learning how to extend these, um, the width of their decline curves um, to extend that high production for longer periods of time. So these next few slides, um, I recently did a study um, trying to decide 
what influences production out of the Wall Creek and Turner sandstones in the Powder River Basin, which are two of those tight sands that I talked about. And I picked the, the Wall Creek and the Turner sandstones because, um, well, first of all, they are the uppermost sandstone members of the Frontier Formation, so you might hear the Frontier, and then the Carlisle Shale, um, respectively. They're time equivalents. Um, and the Turner is, as of now, considered to be kind of a more offshore extension of the Wall Creek. And there's still debate about whether the Wall Creek is a delta or a shelf environment, but um, so they're considered um, correlative, both um, depositionally and time equivalents. So I picked the Wall Creek and the Turner because they are some of, if not the most prolific um, hydrocarbon producers in the state. And I, I told you that um, the Minnelusa was the most, was the top oil producing formation in the, in the basin up until 2013. As of 2014, the Turner overtook it. So they produce quite a bit of oil and gas out of here. So I wanted to see whether um, what's driving this prolific production. Is it more the well techniques that they're using or is it geology? So this is my study area. This is a geologic map of the Powder River Basin. And this is my study area that's basically defined by all the wells that have ever been drilled into the Wall Creek and the Turner. Um, the blue ones are conventional vertical wells and the green dots are unconventional horizontal wells. And because the Wall Creek and the Turner are currently being developed as a horizontal or as an unconventional play, um, for this study, I looked at just production from horizontal wells. Um, and as of this data pool, there had been like 27 operators that have completed 474 wells and produced from 24, 474 wells in the Wall Creek and the Turner. So these next um, slides, you'll see a bunch of um, similar looking graphs. But what these are is um, production on the y-axis plotted against a well attribute on the x-axis and oil production will be on the top, gas production will be on the bottom. And because of the sheer number of wells, I went ahead and split them into Wall Creek wells on the left and Turner wells on the right. And the different colors are the different operators um, of those wells. So this first attribute that I looked at is producing interval length, which is basically the length of the frac part of the lateral. And what I was looking for is to see if there is a diff, you know, as um, the producing interval increased in length, was there a corresponding increase in the production? So I'm looking for a linear pattern through these. And um, when I plotted these up, it's pretty obvious that most of the Wall Creek and Turner horizontal wells are being um, completed with uh, about three to 5,000 foot interval lengths. There's about 20% that are being um, completed with longer lengths, but I didn't see a consistent linear trend with as, as the, um, the lateral increased in length, the production didn't seem to correspondingly change. Even um, operators that varied their, their lengths seemed to have pretty variable success. And, and even these um, longer ones are oftentimes outdone by these shorter ones, which is surprising because you would think that the longer the lateral, the more surface area it's in contact with, and so theoretically the higher production. But I didn't see that with these consistently. So I looked next um, at lateral orientation or what direction did they drill those wells. So I kind of, for these I normalized them 
so that all wells drilled east-west were grouped together and wells that were north-south were drilled together. This shows that most of the wells in the Powder River Basin and the Wall Creek and the Turner are drilled north-south, pretty much. Um, but they have pretty significant variable success. You know, if you look at that red operator, it's, it has really good wells and really poor wells. Um, and surprisingly, if you remember back to when I said that um, the stress direction in the Powder River Basin is about 70, so you'd think that they'd want to be drilling about 160, 165. Only 6% of the wells in the Wall Creek and the Turner were drilled between 160 and 165. So they're not maximizing their orientation. And even the few wells that have been drilled east-west seem to do just as well as their north-south counterparts. A um, couple other ones I looked at were the number of frack stages. Um, again, operators seem to stick to kind of below 40 and less frack stages. There's a couple that went all the way up to 73. But again, there wasn't a consistent linear trend um, with increasing frack stages and the increasing production. Um, the last one I looked at was propent amount. This is the only one where you can kind of see a linear trend. See this, these green wells here in the Turner seem to have some um, benefit. However, it's interesting though that um, the same operators wells that use less propent outdo them, outdo these ones that use more. So the takeaway from these were that, you know, operators are typically completing their wells using a pretty standard formula, but they have variable success and it doesn't seem like the longer the well and the bigger completion jobs necessarily correspond to increasing production. So if well design doesn't, isn't explaining how they're getting all this oil and gas production out of these reservoirs, what about geology? So the study that I did also took a look at um, these attributes of the Wall Creek and the Turner Reservoirs. And because the Powder River Basin is such a big aerial extent, and because there's been um, differences in structural history throughout the basin and depositional environment throughout the basin, I decided to do this comparison of production and these reservoir attributes using a spatial comparison. So what I did is I created um, interpolated surfaces and, and then overlaid them on top of each other to see if the spatial trends um, matched. So this is a interpolated surface of oil production from the Wall Creek and the Turner with the darker greens showing the areas of higher production. That red dashed line is just that study's um, boundary between the Wall Creek and the Turner, just for reference sake. And then this dark green line outlines the areas of highest oil and gas production. I'm gonna use that dark green line and I'm gonna overlay it on top of the reservoir attributes um, for spatial comparison. And likewise, I did this with gas production from the reservoirs too, with the darker the reds, the higher the gas production. And then there's the highlighted um, areas of high gas production that I'm gonna overlay. So the first reservoir attribute that I looked at was depth. So this is a structure contour map of the Wall Creek and the Turner, which is basically the depth to the top of these reservoirs. Um, the deepest part of the basin is shown in these dark blues. And then as you get shallower, you get and get closer to the surface outcrops of these um, formations, you get more brown. So you can see that um, the Wall Creek in general is deeper. It's near the basin axis. When you overlay the oil production on that, the areas of highest oil production, you see that most of the oil production is um, near these deep parts of the reservoir. However, when you put the um, areas of high gas production 
on it, you'll see that the, the gas, um, it's kind of in the deep part here, but there's also this trend of high gas production that extends northeast and up into the shallower portions of the reservoir and into the Turner more. This is a isochore or a thickness map of the Wall Creek and the Turner with the thickest um, parts being shown in um, these whites and pinks. And the Wall Creek in general is a lot thicker than the Turner. When you drape the areas of high oil production on here, um, while there is some areas that are in these thick portions, um, a lot of times for oil and for gas especially, the areas of highest production are more in the thinner parts of the reservoir. So the takeaway from this is that um, for oil production, it likes the deepest part of the reservoir. The gas production um, seems to be concentrated in shallower and thinner parts of the reservoir. And um, as far as oil production goes, it seems that they're targeting these hydrocarbon rich zones within the reservoir instead of the whole thickness, you know, targeting the thickness, thickest part of the reservoir themselves. So a couple more. Um, hydrocarbon production is really dependent on reservoir pressure. So the higher the pressure, the easier it is to produce these um, uh, hydrocarbons. So this is a pressure map of the Wall Creek and the Turner. And in the Powder River Basin, things are considered to be overpressured when they get up to zero 0 0.433 PSI per foot, which is um, designated by the, the yellow here. So anything in yellow or pink is overpressured parts of the reservoir. So you see that this shows that the, the Wall Creek ha is a lot higher pressure and a lot more overpressured areas than the Turner. I actually had this pointed out in a at a conference that this might be an anomaly over here in the Turner. So, <laughs> um, but when you um, overlay the oil production and the gas production areas on this, although there's a little bit of overlap, for the most part, the areas where they're producing the most oil and gas are not in these overpressured areas, which is kind of surprising. Um, so it's pretty impressive that they've been able to produce this amount of oil and gas from these reservoirs under normally and under pressured conditions. So the last reservoir attribute I looked at was the temperature of the reservoir. This is a um, map of the um, temperature of the top of the Wall Creek and the Turner, and it ranges from less than 100 in these 100 degrees Fahrenheit in these blue colors around the basin margins to the, this deep yellow is 200 degrees Fahrenheit and this orange is 225 degrees. Um, the hottest well that I found was right there and it had a temperature of 321 degrees Fahrenheit. When you overlay the oil production and the gas production on these, you'll see that pretty much that 200 um, degree Fahrenheit line very well outlines all the um, oil and gas production from the Wall Creek and the Turner. So that was the attribute that I found to be the most strongly correlative to production. And in general, it's a pretty complex reservoir system as are most of these unconventional plays. And the takeaway from that study was that I think geology has more of an influence on how they're on their production success than these how they're actually designing and completing the wells with the caveat that this is a constantly changing thing so it's possible and this was about a year ago <laughs> this data was from so lots can change um so to kind of wrap up why does this matter to you guys? <laughs> um, 
I, I talked about at the beginning that the survey's mission was to convey this information at, that we um, study out to the public. Another part of the survey is, um, job is to help the consensus revenue estimating group um, determine their budget for the state. So this is a graph of all of Wyoming's oil and natural gas production for the last nine or 10, or actually quite a bit, that's the wrong, sorry. That's <laughs> Again, oil is in black and gas production is in red. And this is, these dashed lines here are what the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group, or I'm just gonna call it Craig from now on, um, decided with input from the survey, um, they think that oil is going to keep increasing f at least for a little while and natural gas production is on the decline. So again, why does this matter to you? Um, because oil and gas has quite a significant um, input into what the state revenue and the state budget is. Um, this is from the Craig report that came out um, last week, actually. And their projected um, severance taxes for the fiscal years of 2019 and 2020 are, their the total severance taxes are projected to be $1.29 billion. And of that, oil is 43% and gas is 26%, I think. So um, oil has overtaken coal is in importance of these um, severance taxes. And if you look, this is kind of hard to read, but these severance taxes are distributed for county roads, towns, schools, highway funds, water projects, the general fund, which is what I'm paid after, so that's important to me. <laughs> but um, it does affect pretty much everybody in the state so far. Um, and getting back to the Powder River Basin, the Powder River Basin has always had a significant contribution to oil production um, from the get-go. However, in 2014, for the first time ever, it reached um, a contribution of over 50% of the state's total oil and production, and it's, it's stayed over 50% since then. So it's a significant contributor to the state and its revenue. And this is just kind of a comparison of the different basins around the state. And you'll see that in last year, Powder River Basin contributed 55% of all oil production in the state. Greater Green River Basin's contributing, contributing the most gas. So what's next for the Powder River Basin? Um, Definitely, they're going to continue trying to develop these unconventional plays. Um, this is all price dependent, though. This is a, um, a federal development area that's currently undergoing an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement process. Um, this is Douglas. It's, it's called the Converse County. Um, it's, if this goes through, there's gonna be about 5,000 more of these wells targeting unconventional plays, but this is a, on federal leases, so the process has been taking quite a, a long time. Um, and the next big target in the Powder River Basin that everybody keeps talking about is developing the Maori Shale, and they're, they're having problems developing it because of the bentonites in the shale that are interbedded with it. Um, are kind of gumming up their production. <laughs> um, but um, a company called EOG has recently seemed to um, at least in part solve the problem. So I'm kind of anticipating that this is gonna be the next um, big target in the Powder River Basin. 
So thank you. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Um, price for gas. Um, gas prices are very low and they're flat and there's just such a surplus. Um, I think I was talking to um, some people that confirmed that we've been hearing that they're almost giving it away in places. It's, it's, there's just so much. And you have to have a pipeline for gas. Yes. Truck. Yeah. Britain just shut down fracking. Britain did? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say that the State Geological Survey um, a couple years ago did do a study um, on whether or not this, hor this con unconventional um, development was having any impact on hazards and earthquakes. The thing that you have to remember is that it's not the fracking, it's the disposal. So when they, when they frack it, they have to bring that fluid back up to the surface and they have to do something with it. So when they dispose of it, that's where the problem starts is because they're disposing of it into wells that are intersecting fault systems. So it's not the actual fracking process itself that's causing the earthquakes. It's the disposal of the frac fluid afterwards. The survey did do a study to see if there was any correlation between that going on in Wyoming. And that reports on our website. Just in general, they said that they didn't find anything. I wasn't involved in it, but um, our hazards guy um, did do that study, and there was not a correlation so far in Wyoming. Is the disposal fluid uh, uh, explosive also? Or what? Um, it's, it's, the earthquakes are not caused by explosions. It's caused by lubricating fault systems. So if a well will intersect a fault and um, inject fluid along a fault zone, it will basically give it slippage. <laughs> so that's, um, it's, it's not explosions. <laughs> sure. So, so this is just a follow up. Is there increased seismic activity in Powder River Basin? No. No? Not, they did not find, they looked at the whole state. And as of the date of their study, they did not find any increased seismic activity. That's correct, yes. That's not the place, yeah, that's not, yeah, exactly. So it, sure. In Oklahoma, they have, they've used 10% oil and 90% of water. And they have huge amounts of water that they have in the So Pennsylvania, too, is having an increase in the amount of water that they have in the But none of the rest of the state has seen it, an increase in seismic activity? Based on their study, the oil and gas industry does not impact seismicity. Yeah, but I just wonder if they've seen an increase. As of their study, they said no. You know, we've got enough going on with Yellowstone. <laughs> so, and there's not a lot of oil and gas production about up there, so. Yeah. A couple questions. You talked about an ISO core. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the difference between an ISO core and an ISO pack? So an ISO core um, doesn't take into account the dip of the formation. So if a if a formation was um, perfectly horizontal, the ISO core and the ISO pack would be the same um, because you're def you're basically drilling, you know, the same thing. But if the um, formation is dipping. Um, this would be your isopack. This would be your isocore. So you might get a, a thicker isocore if a formation was dipping. Does that yeah, make so sense? Yeah. Is that why it's like a core length of that formation? Uh, 
that could be, it's, it's actually um, spelled I-S-O-C-H-O-R-E, so. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, you answered it a little bit, so, but I'm confused because the production is related to demand. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yep. So this, if, if demand goes up, the same wells start kicking back in, maybe they've been shut down for a while, or the assumption is that new drilling is taking place. Does that make, does that sit, make sense? It makes sense. Um, what's the question, though? Um, those production numbers, then, are more related to demand, or once you have a well, you don't necessarily keep producing from it if demand for the product is down? Um, it is possible to shut in a well, and however, it's pretty expensive to shut it in and then start it back up again, so they don't like to do that. Um, so, so the produ increased production is basically new drilling? Yes, okay. for the most part, yes. Was the, that was the, the curves going up and down, that was new drilling? Uh, more than uh, just uh, the delivery from existing wells? Correct, yes. I mean, because when I showed you those steep decline curves, you know, after a couple of years, those horizontal wells, their production falls off. So in order to maintain that same level of production within an area, you have to keep drilling new wells. I see. So with the price going down, then they... They cut back on uh, the new wells being drilled. Right, and so a lot of times you'll see these rig reports, which is basically the number of rigs that are out there actively drilling in the basins, and that will um, increase or decrease based off price, supply, demand, stuff like that. So, and the, and the question about the price is: is the price uh, kind of um, uniform uh, nationally or globally, or is it? Uh, region specific or the, the price fluctuations? <laughs> um, there's a little bit of uh, difference. Um, a lot of times price will be um, based off of these major hubs. So like um, oil prices are a lot of times based off of this hub called WTI or West Texas Intermediate. So it's basically a Texas price. Why, if you take and look at what um, WTI prices are compared to what operators are getting for the same oil in Wyoming. Wyoming's a little bit less. We're about four or five dollars per barrel less than WTI. So, and gas, uh, right now it's a you know few cents to forty cents difference between. Um, they have a hub called Henry Hub, which is a lot of what they base the gas prices off of. If you look at Opal, which is a Wyoming gas price, like I said, you're looking at cents difference between those two. And the global market is uh, tied into all this? Closely? Yeah, the global market is tied into more of those big hubs, you know, so. And more for oil than gas. And more for oil than gas, yeah. Um, who was next? I, I saw, okay. <laughs> okay. Quickly, um, you were talking about the regulatory um, constraints and where they can um, point their horizontal drilling. And north south seems to be what the regulations are saying. What determines wh why they say that versus, say, the <laughs> angle that you were sort of suggesting might be better? I actually don't know. Um, they. They, like I said, they define these drilling spacing units, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, the operator that comes in to, to drill the well first will come in with some geology background and come in front of the commission and say, okay, I think that this needs to be developed this direction. So that's kind of a roundabout guess. Um, that I think they're. Same, so they're not running each other. 
Yes, yeah, there's, there's a whole, whole complicated system that the commission has to deal with as far as density of the wells, number of wells within those spacing units. It's pretty extensive. <laughs> you looked at her map, you noticed that there's the orientation of the boundaries. You can't drill off your lease line. So if that's, if you have two sections or, you know, two square miles, all your wells have to be on those two square miles. Mm -hmm. So if it's oriented this way, you're going to get north-south wells, that sort of thing. And, uh, Thank you. water that they are injecting there's like 10 chemicals that they add to the water what's the purpose of those chemicals that they add um there's actually let's look <laughs> hold on one second things like lubrication yeah that's what i was going to say there's lubrication there's gels that basically you're putting mostly water and a lot of sand and then you have a gelling agent in there and you have to also reduce friction you have to put some glycol ethylene to keep things from freezing up because of the velocities and, and necks that you're going through so it's a it's kind of the depth you're working at and the velocity of the material and yeah, there you go so bear in mind, you're, you're talking about less than 1%. And of that less than 1%, the biggest one is right there on the bottom, which is the gel, right? Yeah, this is, there's gel. There's, this is says biocide to help prevent bacterial growth and stuff like that. Um, scale inhibitors, friction reducers, corrosion inhibitors. Um, so. Primarily, it's something called gar gum. It's a natural from a gar plant, and you eat it every day because it's an ice cream. <laughs> to you? G U A R. Yeah. I only allowed one question, so I'm asking you to hit the ass. When you drive around the state, you can see all these old oil wells, mm -hmm. and the pumps are not moving. Mm -hmm. Now, have they been turned off, or is it the fact that the pressure is now gone and they won't work? They're turned off because the pressure is down and they won't. Oh, so they're not producing so enough. They're, they're not a producing enough to be, to yeah, to be economic anymore. They do it intermittently, too. So That's true. Words, they produce for a while, then the pressure goes down in the well bore. Jacks shuts off, it allows the pressure to build back up, so it, it cycles, in, usually, on a producing well like that. Sure. I lived in Douglas for a number of years, <laughs> four years ago, and my experience then was that they were drilling a lot of wells, and then if they didn't produce this golden amount, they could cap it and write it off as a loser and then someday go back and plug into it and pump oil out of it when, when the price was up. And so I think there's a lot more wells out there than we realize. Yep. At that time, that's when they were doing a lot of the uranium solution mining as well. Yep. And uh, I think it's been pretty hard on that country. Yeah, well, there's been, I don't know if you've been over there lately, but there's, with this unconventional production, Converse County is one of the hot spots in the state. And so it's bringing a lot of new wells, but it's bringing a lot of money into that county too, so. Yeah, well, the bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna ask. So why uranium, or, or why was that um, that was for a totally, that was for the uranium industry when they were. <laughs> a lot of 50s and 60s, there's a lot of uranium over there. They got it by uh, solution mining where they put water down and, and dissolve. dissolve it and bring it mm -hmm. up the water. Mm -hmm. And I had heard, you know, you know that, directly, that there were radioactive components to the solutions. No. Uh -huh. <coughs> sure. Um, so, 
two part question. One, a lot of the data that you had for the wells that you used in your uh, in your study, um, did you like were those provided to you by the operators? Did you get them off like drilling info? Or? Um, all m <laughs> the state geological survey um, does not have a lot of access to proprietary industry data, so the majority of the data was from the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. They have a pretty extensive database, especially for the production data. Um, we do have a subscription to IHS, so I did use and was able to extract a lot of the pressure data, um, some of the bottom hole temperature data, um, but a lot of it was um, calculated from these. We actually looked at a lot of well logs, um, making our own picks, recording the bottom hole temperatures, correcting them to the top of the formations. So um, we, we started with either these public or these subscription databases and then worked from there. Okay. Um, second question. So on your maps, um, where you were showing uh, gas and oil production, I mean, the high gas and oil production volumes, um, there was a red dotted line across there, and I don't remember seeing anything in the generalized cross-section before. What did that? Oh, that was um, just that, uh, that study um, does differentiate between the boundary between what people call the Wall Creek and what they call the Turner. So that red dashed line is just a standard separation boundary of, it's just a generalized. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, we talk a lot about water, and uh, I guess my question is where does it come from, and as your geological survey, do you also assess how much water is available? Um, your second question, um, yes, we have a hydrology team that does look into um, the hydrology and they, they've been working on these projects where they're <coughs> actually trying to um, identify where, how deep you would have to go to get down to saline enough water that would not impact freshwater sources for things like the oil and gas industry. So, because a lot of the water that is used in fracking is fresh water. And where are they getting that from? Um, yeah. Oil companies have their own water wells. So, they're, so if I have this somewhat correct, they're taking the water from the aquifer levels in the, in the area. They're using it to do the fracking down much lower than the aquifer. And then they dispose of it again in another place I assume somewhat nearby. Yeah. And then that could seep down into the aquifer depending on the disposal. Well, the water. disposal wells are pretty deep too. So, and disposal in Wyoming is regulated by the DEQ. So they have to get a pretty extensive permitting process for those disposal wells to dispose because because of even the small amount of chemicals that they do add, they need to make sure this is that's a waste product considered afterwards. So they need to make sure that they're disposing of it in a, in a formation that's deep enough and that's not in con um, contact fault-wise with the freshwater aquifers. Um, I have heard of some oil companies trying to recycle their water, but because some of their formulas are, are formation specific, I know that that's a little bit been difficult for them to do. So it'd be nice if they could figure that out, ways to, re, you know, not have to keep um, pumping water out of the freshwater aquifers and instead of being able to recycle the water from well to well that they're using, so. Is there any concern about the, the amount of water being used on from those aquifers and the long-term availability of it for not only the fracking but for other uses in the, in the region? Um, <laughs> there's always going to be um, concern about fresh water sources, especially in Wyoming. Wyoming, you know, has limited water resources, so um, that's definitely one thing that's, you know, always in, in the back of people's minds when this industry 
is talked about. So I can't really speak as to who's concerned, how much they're concerned. Um, being a state employee, I'm not actually permitted to give my opinion either. So. <laughs> I don't know if they've actually calculated that. Um, I know that they do these um, basin hydrology plans that they put out to um, document all the water resources in the basin, um, both surface and groundwater. So that would probably be a good next step to actually work with them from an oil and gas standpoint and then from the hydrology standpoint to see how this is affecting both industries. Do so. you have a chart on how much water is used per year in Wyoming for that purpose? I don't, not with me. Do you have an idea of how many million gallons per year? Um, Can you get feet or acre feet? Hold on a second. Let's see if I can get through these. Oh wait, I'm going backwards. I'm going the wrong way. Hold on one second. Let me get back. Oh, right there. Oop. Okay, so this is about the best I can give you right now. This blue right here is water production. So, and this axis lists barrel of oil per day, um, thousand cubic feet in barrels of water per day. So a million barrels of water a day, and that's just how A scale on how mature it is, and so lighter oils are more mature. Um, a, lot, have, a lot more uh, lower viscosity. Lower viscosity, uh, yeah, so it's thinner. Lower viscosity oil comes out of this basin versus like tar sands oil or correct. Oh yes, like yes, or, yeah. Or, and the Bakken oil is very similar, similar or lighter yet. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you want heavy oil, go to the Uinta Basin, south side of Canada, <laughs> but, or Canada, which is like that. Yeah. Um, going to, um, I know that our president, John Willott, wants to uh, say something here, but uh, I want to um, say thank you to Rachel for oh. coming and giving a talk here. I'd like to ask you to join me in thank you. Well, thank you. Wow, that's awesome. So, thank you. Accept this on behalf of the survey. We'll hang it in the office. <laughs>